Hello, everyone, and a very, very warm welcome to tonight's event, Carrot or Stick, the impact of government gender policy. My name is Hannah Wise, and I'm a journalist and moderator, and it's my great pleasure to be here with you to host tonight's event. And I'm very happy because we are here in person, this joint event put together by IMD and six. We've got a group of panelists standing by on stage for you. So I really know that that's going to make a difference to our conversation. And while I know you at home, our audience, perhaps you're joining us remotely from work or on the move, we still want you to be very much part of our discussions tonight. So we urge you to ask questions throughout and we'll be putting them to our panelists a little bit later. And I'll tell you how you can answer or ask questions rather uh, a little bit later as well. But today is all about uh, government gender policy and how that's helping us advance gender equality in general. But more than that, it's about how governments are working together with businesses and academia to really push the envelope on this topic. And in a moment, that's what we'll be discussing uh, as part of our panel discussion. But before all of that, we're going to take a closer look at what's being done at a federal level for the advancement of women in leadership here in Switzerland. We'll have a look at the progress that's been made, we'll look at some of the challenges that we're facing, and a little look at what to expect in the future. And for that, I am very, very pleased to welcome our keynote speaker, the director of the Swiss Federal Office for Gender Equality, Ms. Sylvie Durer, who's joining us on the phone. Sylvie, the floor is yours for the next five minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, the organizers from IMDN6, dear moderator, First, I would like to thank you for the invitation and second, to apologize for not being able to be with you in Zurich. Indeed, I have been tested COVID positive at noon and had to isolate immediately. But gender equality is, however, always an issue. There is no good time or bad time to spend energy and money to find solutions. It is always worth to commit to gender equality and I uh, was able to see it once again. I was uh, at the United Nations in New York last week as head of the Swiss delegation to the Commission on the Status of Women. And I was very pleased to see that about 80 ministers from all over the world were also there, despite or because of the COVID crisis and despite or because of the Russian aggression against Ukraine. I have been asked uh, today to speak about Swiss laws and policies. Uh, let me start by observing that in Switzerland, uh, our authorities come with new laws when other voluntary measures, especially in the labor market, have been proved ineffective. So we don't have so many laws, but nevertheless, we have some legal provisions in different issues, and I will ask the organization to show the uh, uh, second slide. Uh, the first uh, law I would like, or the first legal provision I would like to mention is the right to vote. The right to vote uh, was uh, granted to men in 1848, and they were nice enough uh, to give it to women 123 years later, it means in 1971. Since then, we have quite a few of them. I'm not going to comment all of them, but I would like to uh, underline uh, uh, the constitutional article on gender equality, which we, uh, which were voted uh, in 80, uh, 1981, and there we can find, among others, the principle of equal work, uh, pay for work of equal value. Uh, then another element uh, which is very important, the maternity allowance, 14 weeks pay the leave. Uh, before, there were uh, maternity allowance, but they were not compulsory, and there were a lot of women who couldn't benefit uh, uh, from them. I was one of them. I'm not born in the 19th century, but I was then about 30 years in, uh, uh, 90, in the 90s. I have had three children, and I was mm -hmm. only able to get the maternity allowance once because there was always special... Uh, uh, elements which uh, prevented me to get uh, paid leave. Then I would like, and I'll come again on this element, uh, we had a votation in 2013 about uh, uh, reconciling work and family, about having an amendment in our Swiss constitution. It was accepted by the majority of uh, the population, but not the majority of the cantons. 
Then uh, an element which is closer to us, it is a compulsory uh, equal pay analysis for companies with 100 or more employees, which uh, has come into effect in 2020. Introduction of paternity leave in 2021, two weeks paid leave, and then also the full marriage and adoption rights uh, to same-sex couples in 2021. As you see, uh, we have achieved a lot, but we still have quite a few challenges, and you know very well about it. That's why our Federal Council decided to launch an equality strategy last year, and uh, uh, in this uh, strategy, it's on slide three, uh, you have four major goals. It is about women's economy, uh, economic uh, autonomy, about reconciliation of private, family, and professional lives, about violence against women and domestic violence, and about discrimination, sexism, and gender stereotypes. As I don't have so much time, I will only uh, focus a few elements about the situation of women in the labor market. And then on the fourth slide, you have uh, two statistics about the situation in the labor market. And you can see on uh, uh, the statistics, which is on uh, the left side of the slide, that Switzerland performs very well concerning employment rate of women. We see that we are right uh, after uh, Iceland. We have a lot of women in Switzerland who are uh, active in the labor market, who have a good education, and uh, they, uh, they work more than in Netherlands, Sweden, Germany, Norway, Denmark, and so on. So it's really good news, I think, because then women are, uh, have a certain uh, economic uh, autonomy. And then, uh, but then another element which is uh, very uh, particular to, to Switzerland, it's uh, the uh, part, uh, the number of women who work part-time. There, uh, we perform poorly if uh, we compare us with other countries. There are a lot of countries where women, uh, where less women work part-time than in Switzerland. In Switzerland, uh, the uh, pattern is that uh, uh, in, the, in a couple that uh, the man works full-time and uh, uh, the woman uh, works part-time. And... Uh, uh, it can be naturally a choice, and then it's wonderful that we have this possibility in, this possibility in Switzerland, but it can also be um, uh, the, the result of uh, stereotypes, of the uh, unequal sharing of paid and unpaid care work in the family, and the difficulties of reconciling uh, work and family. And there... Switzerland performs not very well. There are different reports of the OECD that we show that there we have some challenges. Till now, the measures which have been taken to facilitate reconciliation of family life and work were more on uh, uh, the individual, uh, individual level. For a long time, you have, for instance, uh, this kind of technique, the time-saving technique. It's on your uh, slide five. Uh, then we had dishwashers, so it helped to uh, save some time. Uh, then uh, uh, companies came uh, with uh, the possibility to do a home office, which is even more uh, popular nowadays, or flexible organizations. But then it's not possible for everyone for different reasons. So we need... In Switzerland, I think child care facilities, it is, it is an issue which is discussed. It is also an issue uh, which is part of uh, uh, the uh, strategy uh, 2030 of the Federal Council. But then I think we have to change a little bit the narrative. Too uh, many people think about child care facilities as a help for women, for parents, for families. And according to me, we have to see it as an infrastructure for the country and for the economy. It means that without uh, child care facilities, our society, our modern society cannot function very well. The same way as we don't have any airport or we don't have trains or we don't have uh, hospitals and so on, it is an infrastructure for the country. And if we see this this way, maybe we are more ready to invest in this issue because it costs a lot of money and it's quite normal. We cannot 
just uh, uh, put uh, babies and children on the side. They need to be well cared of, and uh, the people who care uh, of them have to be uh, quite correctly uh, paid. So this is a billion dollar question. And there, I must say, I was a little bit surprised in 2013. I took part in, um, in a discussion like this one tonight, but we were in presence again in New York. And there, there were quite a few big companies like uh, the ones uh, who are organizing uh, this uh, event today, who said, but what, what, what happened in Switzerland? Why uh, was this uh, uh, new amendment to the constitution about reconciling work and family not accepted? And I said, there, I said to them, but where were you? We didn't hear the economy at this time. They didn't want to take position about this issue. And for me, it's really sad because, as I said, it's not only a question for women, for parents and for families. It's a question of infrastructure for the country. And I would really appreciate also if the economy also was a little bit vocal on such issues because they, uh, I've, uh, I've seen that uh, companies can be vocal uh, on certain issues, like, for instance, the full marriage and adoption rights to same-sex couples in 2021, their companies were vocal, and it was very good. But I think there are other issues which have to, uh, which deal with gender equality and with the good for the whole society and the whole country, where companies could be also more vocal. And with that, I think I'm at the end of my five minutes. So I thank you very much for your attention. And I'm ready to uh, answer to any question you you have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Sylvie Dura. That was very interesting. You brought up a lot of points that we're going to get stuck into uh, throughout the conversation. But uh, before we do start asking questions, let me just introduce you to the rest of our panelists who've been sitting patiently waiting. Thank you all very much indeed. Just to my left, we have CEO of SIX, Jo Steiselhoff. Welcome to you. Thank you. Uh, in the middle, we have Chief Sustainability and Innovation Officer at Holcim, Magali Anderson. Welcome. Thank you. And on the other side to me now, we have IMD's Dean of Programs, Dr. David Bach. Welcome yeah. to you as well. And actually, before we get started, just a quick reminder to you, now is the time you can ask questions. There is a question box for you, which you just need to put your question in. Sit, uh, hit enter and that will come over to us. You won't be able to see the questions that other people have already asked, but don't let hold, that hold you back. Uh, just send in any of the questions that you would like asked today. And I'm delighted to say that we have Josephine Van Santen, who is sitting by in the corner. Uh, she's the Chief Equity, Inclusion and Diversity Officer at IMD, and she's going to go through them, organize these questions, and she'll be bringing, uh, so putting those questions to our panel throughout uh, the conversation today. So let's get started. Carrot or stick? That is the main question really for our discussion today. And Ms. Dura, let me put it to you. You've outlined the achievement so far at <coughs> federal level. So is it the carrot or stick approach that works best for you, do you think? We prefer always the carrot approach, but sometimes we have to come with a stick. And for instance, in the issue of equal pay for work of equal value, the state tried very hard with the economy uh, to have a, a carrot approach. So uh, uh, there was a dialogue, a voluntary dialogue about equal pay. And then there were very few companies who uh, worked with. Uh, most uh, employers who worked with were public employers and not private employers. That's why Switzerland, like other countries, uh, UK, Germany, uh, France, and so on, uh, come uh, uh, come to to the conclusion that uh, we had to uh, to take the stick. By the stick is very mild in Switzerland. In this issue, it's only about making an analysis. And I think it's a li it's a little bit of a pity that we have to oblige companies to make an analysis and to uh, discuss the results uh, with the uh, employees. Uh, because it should belong to good governance of a company to make an analysis to be sure that they uh, comply with equal pay for work of equal value. But isn't it perhaps a, a cultural thing then that Switzerland, you know, we want to obviously work with our companies uh, to encourage people to make the right choices, but perhaps we could move faster if we had a little more of the stick approach. 
maybe, but uh, the culture in Switzerland, the political culture is not about come with, with a lot of law. So when we come up with a, a legal provision, it means uh, in, uh, that uh, we have really tried other approaches, but they have been uh, proved um, inefficient. That's why we came up with, uh, with a legal provision. But um, if we don't have to, I would be very happy. And I think most employees would be very happy. Do you feel that we are moving fast enough then in Switzerland at a federal level? No, no, no. So where not are at the, the federal hurdles? level, not at the cantonal level, not at the communal level. As I said, I think one of the main issues for women is really reconciling work and family. It doesn't mean that all women would like to have babies, for instance. But the stereotypes are that when a woman between 25 and nowadays 50 uh, comes uh, to a company, there is a, uh, there is a, a great risk uh, that she, uh, she'll have to face uh, discrimination because she could uh, have a baby and then to have a maternity leave and eventually uh, not be always uh, uh, present in the company if the baby is, if the children are sick and so on. It's there we see that we have also... Uh, uh, on the part of the company, a cultural issue, but also on the part probably of the couple, also a cultural issue. It shouldn't be only mothers who take uh, sick leaves when, uh, well, leaves uh, to take care of their sick children. So we have uh, more to do in the whole society, but also uh, on the level of companies, so that it's quite normal to have babies. And women who are in uh, age of having uh, babies shouldn't be discriminated. And it's always the case in certain companies and for certain uh, mm. positions. Okay, well, we'll get into the, the company situation in just a moment. But, David, if I could turn to you first of all, because what does academia tell us about which strategy um, is best to develop women in leadership? You heard Sylvie say there, carrot is clearly the preferred option, but is stick more effective? <laughs> Well, I think it's hard to generalize about this. Sure. I think she's absolutely right that you need both. And I think she said something really important there as well, which is it's not you know, stick or no stick, it's what kind of stick, right? So you can have a stick that is a requirement to disclose uh, and naming and shaming can be quite effective. And, and as she said, you know, fortunately, we now live uh, in an environment where information is available and when you compel um, that release of that information, it, it does influence decisions about where to work, with whom to do business. So disclosure alone can uh, play an important role, but then you can go beyond that. You can require compliance with certain standards for public procurement. You can set minimums. You can increase those minimums, right? So it, it really isn't about um, you know, do we have sticks or do we not have sticks, but when do we deploy them? And I'll say one last thing, which is one uh, sometimes not or sometimes overlooked benefit of the debate about sticks is that the debate itself actually moves um, the conversation and, um, you know, swings people into action. So, so I absolutely wouldn't want to exclude um, sticks from the conversation, but it's also true that we want to create an environment where we want to celebrate those who take the lead, do the right thing, uh, for the right reasons, and so recognizing them, you know, with carrots, um, uh, with uh, appropriate attention certainly is helpful. Okay, maybe we can get an on-the-ground <coughs> perspective from Magali and yours. Uh, my question to both of you is what, in it's your experience, and how have you managed to see stronger gender balances in your respective organizations? Magali, perhaps we can start with you. Yeah, I think for me the, the carrot and the stick question is, we've been using the carrots for decades. I've been on the workforce for 30 years myself. I started uh, working on an offshore rig in Nigeria, so pretty much very lonely woman. Mm -hmm. And I can't say I've, things, I've seen things evolving that quickly. Because the problem with the, with the carrot without the stick is it gives millions of opportunity to find millions of excuses. So I would love to have one woman on my board or on my executive committee. I just can't find them. <laughs> I really would love to have them, I promise you. But I just can't find them. Oh, what are you doing to find them? Well, I put an advertising out. Oh, well, yeah, but are you looking for that talent pool where you are going to find women? Are you looking for different type of talent pool? Are you doing that extra effort? And that's the stick that makes you make that extra effort. So if we take the case of, um, before I come to companies, I would just like to talk about France for a second. I'm French, in case it was not obvious with my <laughs> accent. Um, 
when, when France in 2011 put out what, was, what is called the Copé Zimmerman law, which basically imposed 40% of women on boards, it was a huge thing. We will never find them. It can't work. I mean, it was 10 years later, there is about, I think, 42, 43% women on boards in, in France. So they did find them. But what is way more interesting than the number is how that has made the boards evolving. How the discussion at the board is now different because mm. it's way more diverse. And it's not just diverse gender-wise. It's also looking for different profiles than they usually had. So they bring that diversity of discussion and it's way more rich. So I think... I am a, a great believer in the stick because it avoids that chicken and egg question, who starts? Well, everybody has to start because if not, you get the stick. So how important <laughs> then for you, Magali, is government uh, intervention here, government leadership when it comes to, well, to this? It, you, you, can, you can do it without government leadership, for sure, but it just goes much faster. Because without government leadership, you rely on... The, the head of the company to put those in place. And I will mention my uh, previous company. It doesn't mean that my f current company is not good, but because they were a pioneer. So my previous company, Schlumberger, um, which is sending people on an offshore rig at the middle of Nigeria, mm -hmm. did decide in 1994 to impose a quota on recruiting a woman for that job. For, for those technical engineering jobs. Because quota of women, if you fill them up with support functions, nothing against support functions, but what it means is those women will not be in the pipeline of the future decide, deciding mm. people of the company. It, the, the people who are going to become the future executive committees, the future CEOs, etc., comes from the operation or the business background. They don't come from the support function. So also, it's very important not just to think about board level, that it's also important to get the pipeline going. Absolutely. And, and that's why Schlumberger was recruiting 30% women for the job where I was one of the very first ones to be recruited in. And at a time where they did not actually want to recruit me because I was a woman. So you are right. It's a, a, in France, the law that came out last year, 10 years after Copé Zimmerman, is now to say 40% at executive committee. So I don't know how that's going to turn out. We will see, but it makes, I think, yeah, I think you need both, but I truly believe that without the stick, you will go nowhere. <laughs> what about you, Yours? What's your experience in, 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 in driving that gender equality? I, I totally agree with the previous speakers that... Um, a stick is required, uh, required to, uh, to start measuring things, to create transparency, to move things in the right direction, but also to accelerate things. But in the end, of course, it's, uh, it's a means to an end. In the end, we, we should be able to do it without the stick, and it should really Absolutely. be all about the carrot. So if the stick helps us to move in the right direction, and once that direction is set and the acceleration is going and we get to mm -hmm. normality or levels of normality uh, in, in gender, for instance, then I think it will be self-sustainable. Because in the end, the true belief that if you have a diverse wor workforce that you have better outcomes, if you want to rec uh, recruit talents for the future, you need to recruit in a diverse way. All these things are so crucial for a company's success that in the end there's no way of, uh, of uh, going around them and this will be the carrot to make it happen. And you need to, we also have him to introduce some sticks, so some percentages of women in leadership roles and these kind of topics. Uh, we work very hard on a culture of inclusion and diversity. Culture is extremely important, probably even more important than, than, than measures. And then thirdly, you need to go through your processes. We've done a lot of work, for instance, as an example, on our recruitment process. Let's look at our recruitment process through the lens of multiple different uh, viewpoints. So do we use the like, right language? Do we use power language that appeal to men? Or do we use uh, other language that actually appeal to other groups and to, to women also? So you also really need, need to get to your process level to really make this happen. But can you tell me, I mean, do you feel that you're moving fast enough? No. No. So what's stopping you moving from moving faster? I think it's the inherent um, bias, uh, discussion internally whether this really produces better outcomes. It's uh, also, I think, to a certain extent, men protecting their turf. It's all these elements which create a bit of resistance, and therefore you need to break through. That's why the, you need to stick. And once people then see, 
when I started in the executive board, there were no women. Now we have two, which I'm already proud of, but it says nothing, of course. It's not really a balance. But we see the quality of the discussions, the quality of the outcome of our decisions is actually improving. And then, then the accelerator will come. You need to break through this resistance and then it will accelerate, in my view. I mean, David, maybe you can jump in here. Do you think that we, as a general society, just expect things to happen too quickly? I think it's... I think it'd be sad if we set our sights low. I think we okay. should have. I mean, <laughs> look. I mean, it, it should be. We should. I mean, it, we shouldn't even be having this discussion, right? I mean, if everything were working the way it should be working, we would be having equity in all levels. If you take a broad enough sample at any level of the organization, any role, any function, you should have equity. At this point. The majority of college graduates are women. The majority of master's graduates are women, right? And then you see that only 5% of Fortune 500 CEOs are women. So you see this dramatic drop as you start getting uh, more seriously. So if you look at the contrast between the, the clearly available talent and who ends up making it to the very top, it's egregious. And so I think there's absolutely no reason to say, well, this is going to take a long time. Let's be patient here. I think we should be impatient. But I think as executives like yourselves, you know, you also recognize that organizational change takes time, that you need to work um, at it. You need to change processes. You need to change the conversation. You need to set the examples. You need the mentoring. You need the pipeline programs and so on. So I think it's it's okay to recognize that these things are challenging, but we should not be satisfied with the things with the fact that they take a long time. If that if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So let me let me say that slightly differently. The fact that it's hard and takes time cannot be a reason not to have that sense of urgency. A reason not to do it certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, Sylvie, um, I hope you're still with us. Um, what? What kind of leads, what kind of lessons do you take away from, from businesses when you are trying to create gender policy? Well, we see, we see for instance, as far as equal pay is concerned, that uh, it's not an issue for certain companies which uh, uh, want to, to be fair. So it's possible. So, so when other companies say, no, it's not possible, we don't have the data, it takes too, too much time, and so on and so on. No, we know that it's not true because we have uh, some pioneer uh, companies, and it shouldn't be pioneer because we have a, an article in the Constitution since uh, 1981. So there it's quite interesting to see the same thing with the boards. It was uh, mentioned before, so we see that uh, certain boards, without waiting a law, were able to have certain mixity. So we see with certain companies that it's possible. And there is no reason except culture, except um, uh, CEO uh, 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 will, uh, that there is really, uh, uh, not a political will, but uh, uh, CEO will to, to change things. So I think this, uh, this is very interesting always to see that it's possible. And here I'm very uh, happy to hear uh, that it's a help for companies. Uh, to have some kind of laws. Because as uh, the last uh, contributor said, uh, one of the last uh, contributors said, uh, it brings some things to have mixity uh, in, uh, in the direction, in the board. Uh, it improves uh, the quality of the decisions. Uh, so it should be in the interest of the companies, but because of these bias, because of the tr tradition, they are not going to this direction. And for me, gender equality it's really a plus for, for companies and for the whole society. But nevertheless, some people, some companies are not convinced about it, and we have to try to push them a little bit so that they can see and then take the right uh, way to, to gender equality. And surely that means quotas. Where do you stand quotas. there? Absolutely. Quotas is a possibility. I think it's... Uh, uh, well, in Switzerland, we had a votation once about quota in politics. It was... a uh, um, uh, it didn't succeed, uh, and then it was a little bit difficult to have a conversation about it. But uh, now we have a threshold, not quotas, but threshold, uh, which are not very ambitious, uh, but nevertheless, uh, they, uh, they exist, and uh, I think it opens the door uh, in certain companies. And uh, so we see what happened with them, because it's 20% in the direction till... Uh, uh, in the management till 2030, and then 30% uh, 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 for uh, the, the board. 
So we cannot say that it's very ambitious when we compare with other countries. But an interesting thing about it, it's also that it concerns not only uh, the board, but also the management. And I think this is a very important point. Mm. Because if we want to have people at, uh, all over, we have to address uh, all the issues. And what is interesting, it's not, and we, if we take the example of Norway, for instance, they were the first one to come up with such a law. And uh, first they said, okay, but we don't have any women uh, who are uh, educated enough and who have the experience and uh, the, uh, the education uh, to get into the board. Okay, we have to, to organize uh, uh, some kind of, um, of uh, courses in order that we have uh, interesting uh, candidates for our board. But men didn't have any, uh, any uh, how do you say, any, not education, any, any course uh, in this field. And then they had to, to develop course for everyone. And then the quality in general of the board was better. And I think what is so interesting about gender equality that at the end, it is a benefit from all. And then there was the issue also of Norway because they said, okay, but we have too many women then who are uh, in different boards. And this was never an issue when there were men. It was also the same men who were in different boards. And then they came up also with different thoughts about it, with different regulations that uh, uh, the same person shouldn't be uh, on more than uh, uh, so many boards and so on. So with, this, with the issue of gender equality came different issues which are very important and which at the end improve the governance of uh, uh, the companies. And I think it's a very good thing. Thank you very and much. also in this issue, just uh, the, the Federal Council uh, waits more on the part of uh, companies which are close to the public sector. Uh, there, the thresholds are much uh, uh, higher than uh, for, for the private companies. So there also, the, 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 the public sector wants to lead uh, by example, and I think it's very important. Okay, thank you very much indeed, Sylvie. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Josephine Van Santen, who's standing by, uh, hopefully with a microphone that works, and a whole bunch of questions. Yes. What are people wondering about? So the first question here is from Madame Durer, and the question really reads, what would you change immediately, and what would be the role of men? Sylvie Durer, did you hear uh, the question? So, yes, 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 absolutely. What would I change immediately and what uh, could be or should be the role of man? Uh, I think that one of the main issues is really the share of paid and unpaid care work and uh, family work. And we still see that uh, uh, men don't do as much as they should. And uh, uh, there are too many women who say, okay, I have a very nice ha husband, he helps me. Not, he doesn't help her. He makes his share of work. And I think it's very important that men see this this way, that the unpaid care work, which we cannot outsource all the time, that it is a part for both, that there is the mental load when there are children also, uh, to know where they have to be and so on, who has to pick them up and so on and so on, that it's also a share mental load. And I think uh, they have to be more and more conscious about it, and I think we are not uh, where we should be in this issue. It's one uh, element. And then, as I said, I think in Switzerland, in sort of case, the same case in all countries, but in Switzerland, I think we have an issue with uh, child care facilities. We have too few, uh, they are, and they are too expensive. In Switzerland, it's up to 25% of an average uh, uh, salary. So it's much too high. And then we have too many women who drop out of the labor market because they think it's not worth. Uh, first, I can understand this, but then I, I would like to remind them it's always worth. If you like, not in the short time, in the short time, it can be that it's not worth, that you are going to lose money uh, when you have children, but in the middle and long term, it's good for your career and it's good for your uh, pension. Uh, so don't forget this. Thank you. Another question, please, Josephine. Of course, I'm fumbling with the microphone. Question for the business leaders here. Could the approaching retirement wave of baby boomers 
be an opportunity to recruit more women at management level? Oh, this is a great question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I think um, to, ha to have more women at, uh, at management level, you need to do two things. One is to make sure that you have actually the pipeline and that the building up of, of the workforce is, uh, is probably even over distributed in your company and that you make sure that you see that through up until the top of the organization. Because as discussed earlier, so in many organizations, at the most junior level, there are relatively usually actually more women. And then the higher you get, the lower the percentage get and the higher the, the men's percentage get. So that is really something that needs to be attended to, to make sure that the, the room to grow within the organization is not only the male way to grow within an organization. That's something we really need to take care of. And what about you, Magali? No, I, I think the, the building of the pipeline is absolutely crucial, fully aligned with that. I would add just one thing is, I think we need to rethink what is leadership and how should leadership be? Because, um, and I, I use myself quite often as saying I'm a bad example because I went, made my way through in a very male-dominated environment. So I have copied my management style mm -hmm. to my models, which were men, so I'm pretty much of a man wearing long hair type of thing. <laughs> um, but the true diversity in, in the way you make decisions, et cetera, is when you accept in your leadership team people with a different style of leadership. People who are not super strong, who accept to be wrong, who accept to uh, be weak. And, you know, um, Josephine asked me one day, she was interviewing me on um, imposter syndrome, and she uh, said, what do you think of it? And you don't need to take your own case, talk about someone else. Say, no, no, I have suffered imposter syndrome more than once in my life, and I'm happy to talk about it. And her answer was, wow, most senior women won't admit it because we feel that showing any uh, weakness is going to be a problem in our career because of that environment that to, be a, uh, to go up in the ladder, you need to be a strong leader. Hmm. And you need to be a competent leader, you need to have all kind of qualities. I'm not sure being super masterly and strong is the main one. So I would add that yeah. we need a shift, I think, on who we promote. Can I add? Uh, yes, of course. I totally agree. And, and I also have a hope, actually, that the, one of the silver linings of COVID is that uh, men and women have all been working from home. They've been together. They've seen what the other... Uh, part of the relationship is doing either in home or at work and I think in many families there is a, a more understanding for for the different roles I'm nodding play. I'm relating I to have, this I have a lot more understanding <laughs> about how things work at home actually than I used to have be two but years ago may I and I actually you? more actively participate in what's going on at home so I have from from the family side already a different starting point than two years ago and then I would also not be surprised that if we do a survey in our company, and I, I just talk about six in this case, and we look at which teams feel better taken care of in this remote setup, then I would not be surprised if the women leaders score higher than the men leaders. And that's another thing which I think we will see appreciated by our workforce and will drive more change. So I yeah, hope I COVID has a silver lining of accelerating this. I, I think there's another benefit of COVID just to add to what you said, which is it was this moment when we all decided collectively it was okay for the setup that people had for their video calls not to be perfect. Mm -hmm. That it was okay for kids to walk into, you know, the, the frame, even, you know, when it came to television interviews, right? And yep. these things were then being shared. And, and, and a sort of acceptance that we, we all know that you're balancing what you're doing right here on your job with many other important mm -hmm. commitments. And, and I hope that that lasts and that even when perhaps it's not so much in sight as, as it has been during the time when we were mostly yeah. working uh, remotely and virtually, that we remember that everybody we work with in the office is, is a mom, is a dad, is, a, is an uncle, is a grandparent, and, and, and has other commitments and responsibilities in their lives. So no more meeting, meetings after six. <laughs> no more meetings after of. six. Yeah, or not between five and seven because that's, that's when right. the kids are awake and bed <laughs> exactly. off, whatever. I think I, sorry, Sylvia, more I, flexible. I could hear yes. that you wanted to Thank jump in. Much. Please do. Yes, absolutely, because uh, uh, I wish uh, the world would be the way you have described it with uh, home office, but we made a survey. And uh, we have seen that uh, during the COVID time and uh, where uh, so many people uh, were ha uh, made a home office, so men were very happy 
they had more time for themselves, a healthier life, they had time to make sport, they eat better and so on. But women dropped out of work. They took time off in order to take care of uh, their families and their children. So we didn't have, and it was really a disappointment, we didn't have a better share of the uh, family work. Uh, so there we have uh, a lot of uh, work to do in order to change uh, uh, the mentalities and uh, uh, to change the stereotypes. And it was one of... Uh, uh, it was uh, the results of the survey were not waiting for other results, but there it was not very uh, encouraging. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said um, for what happened during COVID and the impact on, on women in the workplace in general. Mm -hmm. But perhaps I can move our conversation on a little bit because I want to pick up on something both Sylvie and Magali both talked about this idea, you know, France, Germany, they all have um, uh, quotas for, for senior board members. Where else can we learn from? Um, and what are the, some of the, the best examples of pushing gender equality in the workplace? I mean, David, f from an academic point of view, where do we see best practices? So I think the countries we've spoken about are good examples. The Nordic countries have been leading for a long time. But I think it's important to recognize that it isn't just that one policy. Yes, they were among the first to put in place um, quotas for boards, but there were also leading, as we saw in some of the data that Sylvie shared earlier, when it came to women participation in the labor force, for example. They were, or they are countries where family leave policies are have long been among the most generous, where they've been the most flexible, where paternal leave has been part of the equation. So it's interesting that it is countries that have done a number of things uh, that have also been leading on the quota issue. So quota is not a silver bullet. A quota, I think, fits in with a broad range of initiatives um, at the governmental level, but also in the private sector to create conditions that make it possible to um, to balance, um, you know, family and and, and work, and and to uh, you know for women to to have the same impact uh, that they should have given given their equal potential. Mm -hmm. Magali. Yeah, I would like just to talk about something that you mentioned and was also on the slide on the paternity leave. I think it's important because when we look at women carrier, is the drop quite often happen at the first baby, mm -hmm. right? And it happens, so you have the problem of the recruiting. Am I going to recruit, um, as we were saying, from 20 to 50? I, don't, <laughs> I think it's <laughs> a big range myself, but because is she going to leave, but also when the babies are here. For me, the... I truly believe that, I mean, I truly believe, no. There is only one true difference between men and women is except Arnold Schwarzenegger, no man has ever delivered a baby before. So I think that's really the only true difference. Once you finish with a maternity leave and you go back to work, so taking care of the girls is purely cultural. Sorry, girls, because I have girls. So taking care of the kids. In my case, I think my husband has changed more diapers than I have. So it's purely cultural. It's, it's, it's nothing else. But the, the physical... Um, childbearing is, is there and for me taking care of the, of the maternity leave making sure that the woman during that time still get the promotion still get the increase of salary still get etc and imposing because I think that's really the way to do it I, I was told that when you don't impose paternity leave a lot of men actually don't take them yeah. mm -hmm. I think for me then brings back equality of treatment because now when you recruit someone Either it's a man or a woman of young age, um, well, if either, either one having a baby will have the same impact. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that's uh, after the quota, that would be the second most important uh, law I would put if I had that power. If you had that power. <laughs> Sylvie, uh, <laughs> you kind of do have that power. So how can Switzerland... Uh, okay. Excuse me. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to ask you, um, how can Switzerland feed into this? How can Switzerland be, be more of a leader here? Because it's quite interesting looking at the dates that you spoke about at the beginning where, you know, Switzerland does mix a lot of changes, but sometimes they are a little bit slow, but then we often have the Swiss finish where we go over and above. Do you think that will be the case in the end with gender equality? Do you think that, you know, once we've got our eye on the prize, that we will get there and we will, you know, really make a difference? Uh, 
I'm, I, 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 there was an interruption, so I didn't hear the first part of your remark. I was just asking how Switzerland can be a leader when it comes to mm -hmm. gender equality. I think well, in certain fields, for instance, equal pay, we have, uh, uh, we have developed a tool which is called Logib, uh, which uh, helps companies to make an analysis. And I think there we, we are a leader because it's, very, uh, it's a tool simple to use, anonymous and so on. So we are very pragmatic and there we can be leaders. Uh, and uh, uh, then in the other issues, uh, uh, well, women are very well educated, as I said, but like in many countries uh, nowadays, uh, naturally we think about uh, Afghanistan where the situation is terrible, but it's really an exception. Uh, in most countries there were progresses. I think that uh, paternity is, is, is interesting because we have only two weeks in Switzerland, it's not very much, so it's not going to be a really a, a change maker. And what is so interesting about it, in the Nordic countries, uh, well, there was this possibility, like for instance in South Korea, you have the possibility for men to take a, a paternity leave, but uh, uh, it is not taken. Mm. Uh, and uh, in the Nordic countries, it was not taken for a long time, till they decided to have a policy which is take it or leave it. So it means that it was not, uh, uh, they had a, a, a sorry, a pat, uh, paternity leave was not very taken, then they developed it into a, a, a parental leave, but then only women took it. And so they had to come with this uh, uh, take it or leave it policy, and really a social pressure, company pressure also, does that man really take it? And nowadays that's why so many men in, uh, in the Nordic countries take it, because there is really a pressure on the part of the companies and the, the society. And then about uh, uh, the uh, maternity penalty, it seems in Switzerland we have some evidence that the problem comes more with the second children than the first one mm -hmm. okay. uh, on the part of company. The company can deal with one child, mm. but two, it's too much. Uh, and uh, uh, But then I said if I had two billion uh, Swiss francs, I think I would invest in the uh, child care facilities yeah. because uh, paternity leave, it's a solution or maternity leave or parental leave, it's a solution for a short time. But then the children need uh, mm -hmm. care for a longer time and there we don't have a lot of things and I think in other countries, uh, France, but also the Nordic countries, but a lot of countries perform much better than in mm -hmm. Switzerland. And there it costs a lot, that's why we don't have this. But I think it's a good investment for, uh, for the whole society. Also, as far as the integration of migrant uh, children or children with uh, other backgrounds and so on, I think it, uh, it's a plus for the whole society and for the economy. So. Hannah, Thank you very I, much. Can yes. I jump in maybe quickly? Sylvia, one thing that I'm struck by, we still have this here on our screen, is on your last slide you spoke about infrastructure. And, yes. And, and I'm struck that Swiss infrastructure is marvelous and when people yes. come and visit this country they see patterns of behavior that they admire and many of them go back to the well-functioning infrastructure and I wonder whether there's something there about thinking about this as an infrastructure challenge as opposed to a culture challenge because if you create the infrastructure first-rate infrastructure for childcare, for parental <laughs> leave, uh, for flexible work then behavior may change, and we recognize it as cultural change, but it's really the infrastructure that has enabled that. Mm -hmm. That's why I, uh, I said we have to change the narrative. And there I think the companies could help, uh, yeah. saying we need this infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it it's goes beyond as physical as infrastructure, as, that's right. Exactly, as long as we say it's a help for mothers, it's a help for families. Uh, no, it's an infrastructure for the country. And I think companies should also come with this uh, because uh, a lot of, uh, so now we are uh, in some uh, in, uh, in an international environment, uh, but uh, I've got regularly questions of uh, women who come from other countries and they are desperate about the situation in Switzerland. We have very good schools, but then uh, they open from 8 to, to 12 in the best case and then uh, from uh, uh, from a two to, to four, and then uh, you don't have any service. So, uh, so there are so many difficulties for, for, fa for families where both parents want or must work. And uh, we, in Switzerland, we push women toward the, uh, 
the part time. I, I think it's a wonderful solution for people who want and who can afford it. But it has a third cost in the long term, uh, on the pension system especially. Uh, and there, I think we need to have uh, other solutions and childcare facilities. But it's where we are really not uh, good, and uh, the evaluation of the OECD are very clear about it. But, but uh, so, the size of Switzerland, eight million people, <laughs> will mm -hmm. will we will have to find a solution for this, and we will have to have more uh, women participating also after either their first or their second child. Otherwise, we won't have yeah. the right people to do all the jobs. So this needs to be taken mm -hmm. care of, and therefore mm -hmm. I think there is a, a a role for the for the government to to support an infrastructure and a facilitation and also a pricing. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, topic that but we need the voice. Yeah. But how can exactly. you work but together? We need the voice of the economy. Yeah. Yeah. We Be need your voice. And, well. you, uh, and uh, the economy was very silent about it. Okay, so I, I really feel that we're hitting exactly the right point because Sylvie's standing there saying that, yes, we need businesses to be part of this infrastructure solution. And you're saying, yes, we need the government to lead the way. So there, there really is a kind of real intersection that business mm -hmm. and academia and government can come together to make a difference here in Switzerland and then maybe be the leader that, you know, we, I was asking about as well. Let me just throw over to Josephine because I'm aware of the time and we're running out. So, Josephine, questions from our audience, please. We just check the microphone. So we have a question here, which is uh, the younger generation in your institution, are, is their thinking more diverse? And are they more open-minded for subjects like inclusion and a new type of leadership? So I think uh, not just business, I think the academic uh, world can answer that question too, but very interesting question. Yes, who'd like to go first? Well, I, uh, very quickly. Do you have I'll, conversations <laughs> with the very the it, youngest of your staff? It's very different. I, when I grew up at school, at uh, the in, when we had a break, the playground, the boys were on one side, the girls were on the other side. We looked at each other, but we didn't talk to each other. <laughs> Nowadays, of course, if you look at school events or other, you see young people. It's all mingling. It's so I true. think the, this inclusion and having different people, different genders, different. Uh, nationalities together is, is much more um, a part of what the youth is currently experiencing already in, when they grow up than what we were used to when we were uh, growing up. So I think that will already make a difference as a start of the conversation. So Yeah, <laughs> I, I have uh, very mixed feelings here. Um, the story I said in 1992 how Schlumberger started gender diversity was because the CEO had daughters who just graduated and that's what made him think. Mm. So I think the kids... Um, today, there's a, a chunk of them and um, who have strong opinion and are really good because they are the children of the decision makers of the current world. So they really play a role, including in environment in my in my job, right? So, so I share the the, the sense that that something is changing. I'll give you uh, two quick examples. One is, um, you know, colleagues of mine have have done research on the role that. Um, sort of formal groupings of young people can play in the organization. Sometimes they're talked about as shadow boards or other kinds mm. of advisory committees. We, we have been studying this as scholars. Um, during the pandemic, we actually implemented this at IMD. We created a, a group that we call YMD, Young at, 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 at IMD. And, and you know, this is a group of 12 of, of our colleagues, 12, 15 colleagues. And, and you know, they've been asked um, to think through how we work, um, um, how we are organized, uh, what it is that we should be pursuing. And they have provided enormous um, input that has shaped our policy about flexible work, that has uh, shaped um, you know, conversations about leadership styles and so on. So I think if you create that infrastructure, you get that. Um, in the MBA classroom, much more um, uh, interest in the topic, much more attention to it. Some of it in, you know, driven by the fact that employers um, care a great deal more and will ask a, an applicant, you know, what is your diversity, equity, inclusion philosophy? But there I think it's also important to acknowledge that that is not friction-free. Uh, because, of course, you know, there are, there are misconceptions. Um, you know, in an MBA program, people are usually not employed. They're thinking about what's next for them. There is a bit of a sense of competitiveness. And so we do have to appreciate also that efforts to provide opportunities to correct 
underrepresentations also do affect the in-group that then starts worrying about, well, what does that mean for me? What are the opportunities? So a lot more conversation, a lot more intention, uh, but not necessarily that alone being a panacea that solves everything. All right, I'm going to wrap things up uh, with just my final question, and I'd like everybody to answer very quickly because we only have a few minutes left. But if you were to give each other advice in what to do more of, what would it be? Sylvie, perhaps you can start. Uh, more of um, uh, uh, changing the culture in the culture of uh, uh, in, in companies, I, I think. Uh, you have to put the, 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 the issue on the table, and it has to be brought by the, by the direction, by the, by the leaders of the companies, by the CEO. Yes. I agree. Culture is really important and leading by example. I think that's also mm -hmm. really important from the top. Magali? Yeah, I think uh, an agreement between business and, and government on uh, what are the priorities. And I agree. I mean, childcare for me is a granted one that <laughs> should be there. It's, it's not even... Should not even be discussed. It's really. been circled many times on my piece of paper tonight, child care. Should not even be I was going to say the same. Make my world-class child care um, really affordable. Um, but I'll say something else, particular, you know, for, for, for the men listening, I, I think uh, acknowledge, you know, you're, you're central to the solution to the progress. And that is not just about mentoring and supporting and taking it seriously, but also, I think, changing the paradigm of what leadership is, being authentic, making yourself vulnerable, recognizing that you don't have all the answers and, and thereby change a conversation. Okay, well, I think that's a perfect way to end things. Thank you all so much for taking part, David, Magali, and yours, and to you, Sylvie Dura, for joining us. Uh, we wish you all the very best of health as well, and thank you to our audience for sending in such great questions and keeping us on our toes tonight. Now, a recording of this evening's event is going to be made available, plus an article summing up some of the conversations that we've had, and it's going to be published by the end of this week. The links to that content will be emailed to everyone who has registered for this event and those of you who have been here with us tonight. And so that at least enables us to keep the communication going. So until next time, thank you very much for being there. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. you very much to all of you. Thank you.